Welcome to the Red Desert, Episode Zero. This is a new companion project to our normal shenanigans on Red Library. What is the Red Desert, you may be asking, considering this is Episode Zero, the very inauguration of this exciting new project with me, Comrade Adam slash Chairman Bain, and my most excellent Comrade Sam, fellow Guerrilla theoretician, artist, and filmmaker. For almost 80 episodes on Red Library, we've been tackling specific books, trying to communicate knowledge and information, history, theory, that typically doesn't get talked about very much or we feel is relevant and vital to organize, to think, to act, to feel on today's left. Well, The Red Desert is a companion project in the sense that it is no longer about what to read, but how to read it, how to theorize, how to actively engage with concept, to critique, to potentially develop new concepts, combine ideas together. And this project originated from myself and Comrade Sam realizing that we are working in the same theoretical galaxy as we are both writing books, dealing with aspects of content and form, time, aesthetics, the cut and the reel, and all sorts of other very familiar topics that you've heard us discuss on Red Library over the last couple of years. So we're going to talk more about the project of the Red Desert and what it's all about throughout this preface episode. So don't worry, any questions you may have, I'm sure they will be answered or potentially provoke more questions, which is kind of the idea. Enjoy this introduction to the project of the Red Desert with me and Comrade Sam, and we hope you're as excited as we are about trying to open up new theoretical territory for today's left. We hope it'll be disruptive, exciting, potentially innovative, and stimulate your own theorizing and critical reflection on not just what to think, but how to think, because that's what we sorely need on today's left. We need them both. Here we go with our preface episode to the Red Desert we call Trending Towards the Vanishing Point of Geist. Do you want to just dive in? We'll just let the the winds of fate take us where they will. I mean, if you want to start there, I guess, I guess we can sort of like give a back, uh, maybe just like sort of like a meta textual intro, I guess, as to like what we're doing. I don't know. I mean, I don't know like how like novel this is. So if we should like explain ourselves. I guess. So my assumption would be we should absolutely explain ourselves. And I think if we spend the first ep, the majority of it explaining ourselves, <laughs> that may not be a bad idea. Yeah, for, yeah, for sure. I guess like in sort of like when we were talking about it, how it was like we were sort of using the podcast medium to like write a book like yeah, sort of yeah. thing it's sort of just like like the idea of when you read a book it's like you're getting the the finished product versus like you're not getting like the years of the author you know sort of coming to these conclusions that they're coming to mm -hmm. and how like like a podcast seems like a cool way to sort of have that like process be then put at the forefront so in thinking about it like this could be just like the preface of the book i guess this sort of thing where it's just like a general overview of why we did this or why we're doing this and like our impetus and how we like we were just like oh like we happen to coincidentally be like somehow working on the in the exact same like theoretical field like what or whatever and how like we were just like shocked at that so we decided that like to do this i guess or something like that i feel like we're already into the episode so fuck it let's just do it <laughs> so okay, okay. <laughs> so i love this idea that this is the preface of the book so we're going to lay out our general methodology our general project like what the hell we're doing and why yeah so you're right i i think we should probably say that putting this process and recording it and putting it at the forefront as opposed to just the finished product, to me is serves a couple of functions. I think one, and we're both writing books. So yeah. <laughs> that's part of it is like, we are both apparently writing books in the same theoretical ballpark, but coming from like Yeah, and like angles. totally just like on accident. Too. <laughs> yeah, which is very, very bizarre. And I think that that's, yeah. uh, so you and I, just for anyone who doesn't know or hasn't listened to the Regrettable Century, you and I met through the Regrettable Century Discord. And then mm -hmm. after you just providing liquid hot magma takes on shit all the time especially about <laughs> film and then we did that uh we did the round table on conspiranoia and i think we just started talking and realizing that our projects are yeah very very much simpatico again coming from different perspectives and different fields but the theoretical approach that i think we're both trying to develop apparently is v so similar and you and i have both 
kind of acknowledge that we have felt like some kind of, you know, low key madmen just wandering out in the desert, just raving at the heavens and uh, thinking that it's very likely that I am just completely batshit insane. But apparently we stumbled into each other in the middle of the desert. And so, yeah, we're going to try to lay out exactly what the fuck it is that we're doing and what we found out in the desert, maybe. Which is funny because the name yeah. of the series is going to be Red Desert after it was, was it the Antonioni, Antonioni film? film? Yeah. 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 I was wondering because the, the Italian title of that film is The Red Desert. And I was thinking about like, are things more, are the more regarded things in history? Do they have a the at the beginning? And I was trying to think, is it, I don't even remember, but is it The Titanic or Titanic? I thought it was The Titanic. Also, I mean, I don't know. The I wonder, Bible? I, the Quran? I, oh, yeah. The, the Bible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Things, I don't know. Things have a sense of weight and superiority when there's a the in front of them. So but. so what does that mean, Sam? Should we put a the <laughs> in front of this this series that we're doing? Because it's going to be a series, right? Like we're going to, this yeah. could be fairly ambitious. And, and if it's going to match our sort of writing projects, this could go all over the place and cover literally every possible domain of theoretical inquiry perhaps the the i'm cool with especially if we're being like uh honorable to antonioni's original title the it is it is the red desert i suppose or yeah, i like that idea desert rosso but yeah and i i think sort of like the so we in a, in our talking of about it that we we sort of had like a preliminary conversation and we're talking about sort of the the how maybe something that's missing in the pod world potto sphere whatever uh, is this idea of like using it as a medium to like develop philosophy over the course of you know like a whole series of discussions so that in the end it all kind of sits together as like a book of of philosophy that's like developed through discussion and where like you know in the general sphere maybe it's like on, on podcasts and I know like this is a, like a format of of yours of Red Library of like sort of having books and and sort of or like concepts from philosophers and then like talking about them and having them be like the episodes and discussions be like maybe like introductions to those books or like overviews of them but then sort of we were thought it would be interesting to sort of use use the the podcasting medium to like write a book in like real time like through discussions and you know book book in air quotes but that can then be like developed in real time and sort of like the so that the process of developing theory is then like put at the front and and is like the the actual thing itself yeah and i think is that a good description of what we're doing (laughs) i i think it's a perfect description because i think that besides the fact that you and i are again i'm collecting together the blog series that i've been doing or the the blog posts which are really have kind of turned into proto book chapters Mm -hmm. you know so that's what i'm trying to work on and developing you know what we've been calling a dialectical pessimist perspective across subjectivity across political analysis like different sorts of realms so i think that's part of it but I think this is also something that as, you know, the show Red Library has developed, I mean, we're up to almost 80 episodes now. And, mm-hmm. you know, as we've developed, I think that we have started to realize, okay, well, what what is it that this has turned into or how is it evolving? And I think the primary thing that we've really discussed is that I think a lot of podcasts, like the medium typically gets utilized to either, you know, have like a talk radio format, um, you know, doing (laughs) interviews, or it's kind of like what we've done, which is, hey, we're going to read through this book and then we're going to teach the material. But mm-hmm. I think the potential of it to, in terms of us, you know, we, we think about ourselves as a political education podcast. And I think at first it was, well, okay, we're going to like introduce certain books, obscure books that seem really relevant and important for today's left. But I think as we've gone through these episodes, what we've realized is that learning how to think about different theoretical topics different ways to engage them, how to actually go through the process of theorizing itself together with other people and have that be captured. If there's anything unique about what we do, I think it's our particular way of doing that. And so, you know, us doing the series together and kind of what you're describing is this like active theorizing in the moment that you're listening to that eventually, you know, might lead to a book or lead to a certain like political program or whatever. But, you know, you never really get a chance to to capture all the discussion and critical thinking and theorizing that goes on. So to me, I think it's also a shift in terms of like Red Library as a podcast, actually really kind of looking at what have we done? 
you know, what, how does it seem like the show's evolving and what does it seem like we really want to contribute to? And so this idea of like, how do you invite people into the process of theorizing, I think is just as important for politics as just, you know, knowing what book to read. Like, okay, you should read X, Y, and Z from Lenin, Solomon, and Mao or whatever. You know, again, mm-hmm. I mean, one of the things that drove me away from a lot of leftist organizing, I mean, I still do leftist organizing, but a lot of groups was this idea of like, hey, so like, how are we theorizing these topics about the state or the economy or culture, identity, subjectivity. And, you know, you don't get answers for any of that shit. You just get the same syllabus that's handed to you of like reading the same shit. And it's like, I'm tired of that. You know, it's like, I want to do something different. And so hopefully this is an attempt to capture the process of trying to do something different and maybe use the medium of podcasting to, yeah, to sort of like break open a, a new way to engage together in politics and theory. Yeah, there definitely seems to be now more than ever this this idea of like reading a text and then the sort of like the text just becomes my opinion sort of thing of just like I'm just sort of like quoting in real life sort of stuff I've read rather than sort of like in, interpreting stuff and, and and reading through things and, and sort of incorporating, taking these concepts and being like, oh, well, if I read it this way instead of sort of the way this author meant it, then it can be like integrated into this like more more like interesting framework or something like that. And and sort of that's, that's what like attracted me to doing this with you in the first place is this idea of like we, you and I like don't have a plan for this at all. Like we're not like sitting down and have like an outline of what we're going to yeah. talk about. It's like literally like happening in real time. And so maybe like, you know, whatever, like five episodes later, one of us could go back and be like, actually that thing I said, you know, five episodes ago was wrong. And I actually like think this now and sort of, I think that's sort of like a big, uh, a big reason by why like someone like Lacan is sort of like seen as a gri- as like a grifter mm-hmm. <laughs> sometimes is, is because, you know, throughout the different seminars, you know, he changes definitions of his concepts. He like sort of develops them into different things. He leaves stuff behind and comes up with new stuff rather than being like, like, like uh, sort of just like having these like set in stone concepts that are like un- unchanging and so people kind of see him as like someone who doesn't actually like know what he's talking about and like making it up as he goes. But I think there's more like truth in that uh, uh, of like sort of correcting yourself and being like actually like after like reading all this stuff, it's like I'm going to go back and like change what I originally said and 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 things like that. That I mean, that that's sort of what attracted me to this project in the first place. And even even sort of if the philosophy we end up developing isn't of interest to anyone, I mean, I hope it is, but uh, but at least hopefully someone could get from this is sort of, you know, like seeing how like concepts are developed by literally like listening to them being developed in, in real time and, and stuff like that. And I think that's sort of something that could be beneficial the, the sort of by by putting the process at the forefront of of the project which is incredibly meta because you and I are going to talk about tearing down or critiquing narrative <laughs> as a general yeah, form. Yeah. So we're, I don't want to yeah, let sure. the cat out of the bag out of that too too early, but yes. You know, I think it's it's really interesting to bring up Lacan here too. Despite all my criticisms of Lacan, and just to be really clear about this cuz sometimes I think we get labeled Lacanians, like I don't myself or even like Alex on Red Library, we would call ourselves Lacanians, but you know, we're very yeah. influenced by Lacan. And I think it's no accident that Lacan's works were always seminars, right? The main primary works were that collective experience of him, you know, like coming and saying, okay, here's what I brought. Here's what the last years of like research and reading and thinking have brought. And I think there's something that still is very powerful about that to me. Again, it's, I mean, just to say this really clearly, it is okay to change your mind. It is okay to be like, you know, I was, actually, I was wrong about that. I mean, as, (laughs) as weird as it is to have to say this, I think a lot of times I've seen in a lot of like leftist organizing and you know, I want us to maybe talk about our particular perspectives that we're going to come at this general theoretical area that we're going to work on. But, you know, one of those for me is political organizing and labor organizing. And one of the things I've mm-hmm. seen most often is how damn near impossible it is for people to just admit that you were wrong about something. <laughs> like, it's okay. You know, it's like, it doesn't mean that your identity is going to crumble to dust. I mean, hopefully it won't. If you realize three months down the road, shit, you know, I rethought about that. Well, maybe it, it necessitates that you're already engaging in a process of critical reflection and theorizing. And it isn't yeah. just, hey, I read Mao's on contradiction. And now that's what I think. And so no matter <laughs> what you're talking about, I'm going to just deploy this critique at you. And if there's anything I want anyone to take from Red Library, it's that, no, like that is not what we're talking about with political education. It is more of this process of like the the way to engage in, with things theoretically. And the fact that whether you realize it or not, 
you're interpreting things. Every single political mm-hmm. text you're engaging with, you are interpreting that in some way. Sometimes I find it really strange to me that even the idea that there is a process of interpretation that happens in engaging with even what you think are like the most canonical texts of like leftist like political theory, even that question is like not even engaged with at all. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, one of the things I think that I hope we do whenever we critically read a text on Red Library is that we're we're trying to, you know, in a weird sort of therapisty kind of way to say this, we're like trying to model what it is to engage critically and interpret things and that you can interpret things in different ways and that's okay and that it's generative to sort of like mobilize the dialectic in the moment to to engage that process. You know, we don't want to collapse it. We want to in some ways like to me, sort of like explode the contradictions of different interpretations. Like that's what we want. That's a good thing. Yeah. I mean, as Hegel said, man's thoughts are plagued by the context in which he exists. So, I mean, and even in that, in this interpretation, it's like everything someone reads is sort of being come at by already this like plagued perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like that was Hegel's whole criticism of Descartes in his famous line i think therefore i am it's like well no you don't you think because you exist in society and you are raised by your parents and you have friends and that and you live in a specific historical context that led you to believe that you think therefore you are and uh and so um hey Sam, yeah I so mean, yeah i mean would you basically say that hegel's critique of descartes is we live in a society yeah <laughs> for sure yeah <laughs> But yeah, so so I guess I think that's like what what sort of my interest in what att- what attracted me to doing this and what what made me think that it could be like of use and and sort of is a, is a kind of a novel idea is is sort of maybe um this sort of like fluidity in and sort of emphasizing process and and stuff like that whereas like versus these sort of like rigid rigid lines of of reading and yeah, I mean that is a good summary i guess did you want to talk about actually like the philosophy that we're gonna talk about for yeah. however long we do yeah i yeah. mean i guess I'm, I'm trying to decide if it makes more sense to describe the philosophy or to describe how we both come at this or where you know we're, we're looking at maybe similar things from different different perspectives or different angles because i find it really hard to even talk about well how do i come at these general topics without like by necessity having to describe what my sort of socially contextualized position is on these topics so i yeah, for sure. I, I could really go either way i mean i don't know what do you think is the best way to come at it i guess like sort of in in stepping outside and of of what we're doing just to like as an explainer i guess like, like that basically with this this whole thing i mean i don't know how long it's gonna end up being if we're just gonna like do this forever and, but uh <laughs> ba- basically this whole endeavor is to develop a theory of form and content and their relation to each other and their relation to and forms and contents of a you know like ontology epistemology uh, politics, aesthetics, history, like stuff like that, sort of like developing this philosophy of these, of basically these two terms, how they relate to one another, and then sort of like applying that philosophy to all these like realm realms of study, I suppose. Does that, is that a nice pithy summing up? Yeah. I, I honestly <laughs> was trying to think, how do you even begin to summarize like what it is that we've been sort of stumbling around in, in you know, the red desert trying to find. Um, but I think that's it, is that we both have repeatedly come back to this idea that most of, I think, how we encounter, like, quote unquote, the discourse in, for me, like, left politics or in the realm of, you know, not always the case. I think in, like, very in-depth theoretical work, uh, you might sort of see more nuances and distinctions here. But I think more often than not, most of the things that I see people sort of, like, critiquing or, um, like, disagreeing on, to me, have, have more and more really, uh, I think, become collapsed into particular sets of content. And the form itself, like a formal analysis, a formal critique of what the larger systemic sort of context and background and the things that structure the very form that the content is held in itself. And we'll talk about, you know, retroactivity and like, I think you and I had shared some messages and you had this like brilliant idea of like, you only understand what the form is going through the content in a sort of like retroactive, like afterward kind of way. Um, But in general, the idea is I think that most of us, we typically um, get locked into this idea of like critiquing different forms of content without realizing that a lot of the time, I think, especially in left politics and theorizing, it shares the same form 
itself, which to me is sort of impossible to think about without the larger social structures and historical context which shape those forms. So I think for, for me, my sort of interest in this or why this has become kind of the thing that I feel like I've been writing about and like grappling with most at, at sort of the most core level in the, and especially the capillaries blog pieces on like dialectical pessimist subjectivity. It's really a way to try to talk about this. Like, how is it that as subjects and, you know, this is one angle that I come at this from. I think people that might know, listen to the red library know that I'm, you know, I'm a therapist, I'm a social worker. And so thinking about different approaches to therapeutic work, clinical work, psychoanalysis, object relations, affect theory, which I've been very influenced by over the years, all these different perspectives, I think, have given me a sort of interest in thinking about how is it that, again, the form of subjectivity as we experience it is really, I think, tied very materially to the larger like social and political structures of our time. And so, yeah, I think it's just this idea of like, realizing that a lot of the things that I'm encountering and I have encountered for a long time have just been about the content itself. And this is maybe what what we were getting at, at least in the realm of like leftist politics is like, for example, let's just get super meta with it. If we're doing a podcast and we're basically like, hey, here's this book, we're going to try to teach it to you, blah, blah, blah. We can interchange the, the content out of that general format, that general form over and over and over again. But, you know, in a way, like us doing this project to me is a way to, again, try to like reshape or explode the form and say, well, like, okay, well, what if podcasting was something completely different? What if it was used for different purposes? So that's just a simple example for me of like how I'm more interested in and sort of disrupting form or like analyzing or looking at things and critiquing on the level of form and not just content. And I hope you know, us going through this process is like in a weird, like kind of meta dialectical way, like us even doing this is like an example of what it means to, even in the realm of like media and podcasting to go at form versus content. Yeah, definitely. I think in left politics, I think we, we were talking about this before where there, there tends to be like an emphasis on, you know, we have to focus on real people and, and, and their material needs and, and stuff like that. Like, fuck, fuck these like, uh, abstract conceptual philosophy shit. Just like, give me the answer now sort of thing. Like we have to, you know, focus on real people and real issues and stuff, which is, which is fine. And, but that sort of, I think misses the forest for the trees. I think, um, we were talking about where um, if you want to talk about, you know, real people and, and real issues, you have to think abstractly beyond social reality and not just like the, the content of social reality, but the, the forms in which those emerge from and, and, and that sort of holds that social reality together. I think we were talking about before something like like in, in painting, the history of painting, for example. And I guess, I mean, everyone knows who you are, I guess. So um, I, I guess no, no one will know who I am, hopefully. <laughs> I was say, do you uh, want it that way? Do you want to tell them who you are? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, my name is Sam and I'm uh, an artist I, and I make films and mostly and uh, write, I guess, philosophy. I don't have any like fancy degrees or anything like that but <laughs> yeah abolished um, degrees <laughs> yeah but anyway so back to my point this idea in the history of painting where it's like you know to we sort of think of painting now and someone someone like like mark rothko for example it's like if you were to show one of his paintings to like Raphael or something or some some a painter who you know existed in this time where it was like painting existed to like you know depict reality or semblances of reality and and religious narratives and and sort of things like that and at some point there was this like break in the medium of of thinking about like well what else can this do besides you know like imageize or like vis- or make visual representations of narratives and you had abstract expressionism and stuff like that which sort of was like well we can use these for the formal elements of these mediums to like evoke something deeper in someone to to have this like more like affective encounter with with this and and you know using conceptual forms like you know depth and and color and and stuff like that and then the forms of like you know the materiality of paint and like the the idea of and stuff like that where there was this break of like you know this this thing doesn't have to tell stories like it can do more than that and i think sort of like i'm i'm really interested in 
in applying that to in a philosophical realm, I suppose, of that, you know, it's like, and, you know, certain people have theorized this emphasis before, like, you know, like people like Marshall McLuhan, where he came up with the idea that like any, anytime you're interacting with like media, it's your, the, the form dictates how you're interacting with it. It's not like the content or something like that, where, or something, you know, a big, a big aspect in film theory is, is sort of the, you know, the big thing in editing is like the Kuleshov effect theorized by Lev Kuleshov, which is like, do you know what that is? Like the, where no, it's I like, have no it's idea. Like the, so educate me along with everyone else. <laughs> I mean, I can't pronounce his name in Russian, but Kuleshov, uh, he's the guy who theorized the idea of like, if you have an image of a man and then you cut to an image of a coffin, it produces a different, uh, it evokes a different emotion than if you had an image of a man and cut to an image of a glass of lemonade or something like that evokes like a different emotion. Is the uh, He sort of developed the idea of like montage and, and this idea of like cutting from one image to another creates different like responses and stuff like that. And and it's generally that sort of theory is generally read as like the content of the images like evokes the emotion where it's like it's like a man and then a coffin and that evokes like a fear of death versus like a man cut to a glass of lemonade and that like makes someone thirsty or something. But I think the the important aspect of it is the cut is like Absolutely. is the void mm -hmm. the void in between the two images and it's like and it's it's even more interesting because there is no gap in between two images in film editing there is no like frame there's no like space in between it goes from one frame to the next so there is nothing there in between them but the act of cutting then creates that sort of void between them that is what the affect is and then the content of the affect is whatever the image is determined by like the images but the idea of being affected is within form and the content of affect is is then determined by the content of what is you know affecting and what is being affected does that make sense it does make sense to me <laughs> but perhaps only because i've read a bunch of lacanian psychoanalytic shit and so the idea of that the cut or the gap is something that isn't really there it's like a phantasmatic effect of like the particular way that the cutting happens or yeah exactly yeah, yeah. and so i think that this is maybe something that you know we're probably going to be talking about a lot but this sort of effect of this like retroactive way that you can look back and then say oh it was this gap there and like how you fill in that gap or how you you know i think maybe like Tom McGowan might say like how you try to paper over it in a certain way but it does mm -hmm. seem like that this is going to be a key part of how we think about things and also this is a very key part of Keynesian approaches hegelian approaches as well so it sounds like that's that's kind of the if I had to say like the general kind of like fashion, but that isn't the right word, but the general fashion we're kind of a, aligning with and exploring out of, I think, is kind of that Lacanian, Hegelian approach. But, you know, again, trying to push it in different ways or to explore different avenues in it that maybe for both of us, we, we kind of hope are maybe kind of novel or at least, you know, maybe been hinted at, but we want to like push those further. Yeah. And I guess maybe in addition to people, hopefully not knowing who I am, I only say hopefully because like, if someone does know who I am, that's like weird. Uh, that, that would, that would terrify me. Yeah. Is I guess my, I am comfortable in saying that I, my sort of philosophical school that I come from is Hegelian in that I am a communist. Those are the, the only two words I like to describe my uh, myself with, I guess. <laughs> Hell yeah. Hegelian communist gang, rise up. <laughs> no, I think since, since we're starting to like deploy this word pretty heavily, in our very preliminary discussions, it also seems that maybe if there is something I think that has been pretty novel or at least interesting in what at least I think, you know, our discussions have been about so far. And I definitely know it's one of the things I'm most interested in in my own perspective on this and my writing on, you know, the Capillaries blog and like what feels most relevant to me as form and as content has to do with this relationship between, I think what I've sort of seen as two typically like divergent camps or two mutually opposed camps, at least in academia, which is Lacanian psychoanalytic critique and affect theory. And mm -hmm. one of the reasons why I've been so drawn to, to Mari Rudy and why she's been so influential on me is because I think she has a way of like weaving in and out of both camps in a way that I found to be like not just theoretically uh, mind blowing in a lot of ways, but I think is like actually reshaped like fundamental day to day experiences that I have and like ways that I operate in my life. And maybe this is, you know, my perspective as a therapist and coming at this thinking about psychology and subjectivity and like affect, but there's always this part of me that, that wants to 
push towards saying similar to how like Rothko would say, right? Like by putting these two shapes or like whatever, these two colors together, how do I capture some very broad abstract formal experience of the world or of like alienation or like depression or like despair or whatever it might be and like capture that in a way that's going to cut through certain experiences of interpretation to then like, you know, like mobilize a certain affect, which then becomes this catalyzing engine for other things in your life. I think that, you know, right in terms of like writing, the way that I feel like I've, I've found that I, I prefer to write or what feels like most genuine to me is writing in a way that is trying to simultaneously be like very abstract and like kind of like Lacanian and talk about, you know, the gap and the traumatic cut and and the symbolic and everything else. But to look at affect theory as a necessary component or a way to weave them together, to look at affect as sort of like this kind of engine or like catalyst of behavior and thought as well. And a lot of my actual therapeutic work, I've said this on the show, but I, I specialize in working with survivors of violence and trauma and uh, abuse and I mean, things that would qualify is torture by any measure, you know? And so one of the things that I found that's most helpful for me in my therapeutic work, and you know, I identify as a survivor myself, I've been through that shit as well. And the thing that always eventually like broke open, like how to make sense of all of this. And as weird as this is, I think the seed of this was planted whenever I read Sarah Ahmed's like The Politics of Emotion, which is her basically talking about, have you ever read that, Sam? Uh, I have not. Yeah. So So basically- Give me the- the explainer. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it was sort of a core, it's a core text in affect theory, but basically she spends multiple chapters trying to describe how certain texts, how we relate to them. And through the, the experience of affect and emotion, it tends to mobilize us into certain types of politics, or it tends to reinforce certain ideological worldviews and that it's really difficult to talk about these things like ideology of like, why do people engage in politics in the way that they do? Why do they align with this particular position versus is this other position without having a very like rich and and pretty deep ex- theory of how does affect serve as this linkage towards these more abstract philosophies, um, whether in politics or, or whatever it is. And I know we, we mentioned this the other day too, and I'll just kind of touch on it very quick. You know, I, I just finished reading Zizek's The Courage of Hopelessness. And one of the things that I got very excited about is that, you know, at a certain point, he talks about Frederick Lourdon's The Willing Slaves of Capital and the way that Lourdon is trying to use Spinoza and Spinoza's approach to affect, which again, you know, became paramount in influence on Deleuze and Guattari, on like uh, Brian Masumi, on everyone, on Sarah Achman, on everyone who came out of this or eventually developed into this like, quote unquote, affect theory camp. The idea was that, like this realm of affect is something that is also more, I don't want to say primary, but it's sort of like undergirds like the bourgeois individual subject. And that the experience of collectivity itself or the experience of affect in a way is like our linkage to this collective kind of experience. And I also call myself a communist. And one of the things I've been really pushing for in my own writing and thinking is to say, how often do leftist critiques again, thinking about form, don't even realize that even you can switch the content in and out. You can call yourself X, Y, or Z. You can call yourself a socialist or an anarchist or a communist. But if the form of that is still trapped in this like bourgeois, individualized, atomized subject, how much is that, again, not actually being that disruptive to the mechanisms and like processes of capital? I don't know if any of that fucking made sense, but like basically the idea is like, you know, to me, I think that even someone like Zizek like hints at these things and like Frederick Lodon like might hint at these things. But to me, it feels like there's just so much potential there to really push this out into these different realms and really look at, you know, how affect and form and content and all these things actually could be conceptualized in a way that like I think has real gravity and power. I mean, maybe that's just me being a, you know, megalomaniac because this is the shit that we're talking about. But I really do think, you know, for me as a, as an actual political subject, this stuff is important to me because like, this is how I make sense of like, what the fuck to do about any of this and what does it all mean? Yeah. There's a sense like Hegel talks about the, the idea of, of universality and, and the universal and how universality has to uh, sort of attach it to itself to the it has to be brought about through the particular and that sort of like any argument against universality i sort of find immediately wrong i guess because even if like if there is no universal aspect even if that were true 
aren't we then all like universally united through the fact that we're all like individual particulars not universally united by like a universal unifying force and in it in that that negativity is then the unifying force and and so when when we sort of talk about these things as you know these certain schools of thought like ethic theory and you know sometimes even psychoanalysis as mm-hmm. as these like individualist fields of study it sort of misses the fact that the universal has to be read through the particular and and where i think sort of and you know i suppose a, an artist in sort of like art is almost the re- the reverse of that it begins with a particular a singular object that then explodes into like a universal idea or a universal notion and that's where i think the sort of importance of and the overlap of sort of because i sort of come at form and content thinking about it from spending most of my life in an art theoretical context and then and and being able to like bring them into like a political realm or a philosophy philosophical realm is 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 sort of what i'm interested in doing like taking the these ideas of form and content from like film theory or like you know aesthetics or something like that and then like in in finding like the parallels and how they're like simpatico with politics because if like a unification can occur between them between this idea of like a universal that has to be revealed through a particular and a and a particular that explodes into universality there's something interesting there and i think on the sort of another i guess like objective of ours is there's like the sort of like psychoanalytic side of what we're doing, like the affect theory side of what we're doing. And then there's the other side of like the sort of ontological and epistemological and philosophical and all the other coal words. Uh, Hell yeah. And uh, bringing out the real smart guy <laughs> shit. <laughs> and sort of the idea of like, and especially on, there's been a, you know, a historically long struggle between materialism and idealism in in philosophy and and especially on like leftist politics and there and sort of i'm in, i'm interested in kind of blowing that up and uh, the idea of like just as an example it's like materialism the idea of materialism is a, is a form and sort of matter is is the content of that form and sort of to be a, tr- a true materialist i think you have to think about materialism as an idea and not just matter. So I think that's like a, a thing we're we're getting at as well. This this idea of I think we talked about the idea of the vanishing point in in like painting and drawing. This the where where sort of a, a drawing itself, like let's just say you have like a, a landscape drawing or something like that. There's how how a painter or drawer sort of develops the depth of field in a painting is they have the vanishing point. In the painting, which all the parallels of the that determine sort of like the depth of field all head towards and then collapse onto each other and the vanishing point. And I think that the term vanishing point is is an interesting one because vanishing denotes something that isn't there and point denotes something that is present. And so there there's this like presence of absence or like an uh, an absence that is present that that is material, something that isn't there that is material that determines the trajectory of all these lines uh, sort of thing, something like that. And and I think is like something we're getting at, the idea of like form as this absence that the content of presence erupts out of and and how to hold to hold that sort of maybe like paradox of presence coming out of absence is is something we're gonna get at i guess (laughs) you know already this is causing me to think about things in a different way that i think is you know again like this is kind of what we want are you familiar with althusser's idea of uh or the way he talks about overdetermination yeah vaguely yeah well the thing that i just thought about is how you know, I think in in some respects, you know, Althusser. I mean, it's a, you know, core contribution to 20th century Marxist thought, like his his way of sort of appropriating overdetermination into the realm of, of political economy. But the idea was that you know, overdetermination, like in the final instance, the economy is determinant. I feel like the thing that you never hear anyone say, though, the other part of that is that, but that final determination never actually comes. And I wonder if like there's a way. It's like this is kind of a weird example of this paradoxical kind of thing. It's like, yes, this thing is absolutely the thing that determines everything else, but you can never actually like find it because it it's structured 
by being absent. You know, you can never yeah. get down to this like fundamental like bedrock because in a way it's like part of this weird ontological experience that's paradoxical of like, yeah, but it's like, but how do you ever like separate those out and like can like totally understand what is the economy versus politics versus culture versus, you know, ide- like ideological state apparatus, whatever it is. It's an interesting thing to think about. And I think sometimes those types of, I mean, you know, the nature of a paradox is to be like bizarre and confusing, you know, I mean, yeah. Zizek might say it's kind of like a climb bottle or like a cross cap it's like it's these weird like hyper dimensional sorts of things that like appear to us as paradoxical but it's it's kind of like the kind of say something really strongly it's like the nature of reality itself is like what you're encountering is in fact paradoxical and weird and contradictory as we experience it yeah that's a very like connecting out this air back to hegel like that's a very hegelian notion is sort of adding hegel's concept of geist is that geist the end point of geist is that it, it never fully unifies with its surroundings and it's always sort of reaching forward for this thing that's unobtainable and obviously that connects back to desire and and the unobtainable object and stuff like that but yeah i think and i think that's an important aspect i just have to say really it, fast for anyone that's listening to this that is like a like a big althusser stan you know althusser not a real big fan of hegel and all that other bullshit. So this is a prime example of how like the content might appear different, but there might be, yeah, again, like shared forms of this sort of more ontological kind of aspect of what's happening. This is like, to me, that's like the whole point of why we're doing this is to like, think about how do you actually see things that might appear to be contradictory in content, you know, may actually share a similar form in a lot of ways. Yeah, definitely. I spent a long, a long time uh, trying to like break away from Hegel, I guess, in sort of like the way like millennials hate boomers sort of way <laughs> of like, fuck this old guy. Like, yeah, I need like some rad like punk philosophy. <laughs> Hello, and, fellow uh, kids. <laughs> yeah. And so just like going to like, like to lose and like all that shit. And, uh, and I mean, it's, it's not shit. I mean, there's value in everything, I think. And there should never be like X versus Y. It should be like X and Y sort of thing. But, Hard uh, agree. Um, Hard agree. But in doing that, it even it led me then back to even being more like Hegelian than I started, which is a pretty like Hegelian idea. <laughs> Uh, well, so that was the like, thing with yeah, Lacan like too, you never, right? You never get away from him. He's like fucking Amazon or something like that. Like yeah. Just- <laughs> <laughs> he is the Jeff Bezos of philosophy. <laughs> so- he just owns everything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, this is why Lacan, in his moments where he is most profoundly saying he is not Hegelian, he is the most Hegelian. I mean, this is also <laughs> yeah. what Foucault said too, right? It's like, the second you think you've escaped Hegel, you turn around and he's right there standing, waiting for you again, you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, I don't know. Did, I feel like I, did I interrupt you before? I can't even remember. Yeah. We're just, we're in the slipstream. We're in the zone. <laughs> I guess what we're getting at is what maybe maybe something we should touch on is uh, I guess the, the the classic discussion trope of we, we keep s- talking about these words form and content and and saying like oh we have to like view form and content and like sort of like maybe uh, and, and I sort of gave an overview of like what the project is going to be to develop a philosophy of like form and content and maybe you know we don't have to just like say what they are in a sentence but like maybe what you think of when you hear those words and sort of i mean and we've talked before of of sort of why what was the impetus to, uh, impetus for us to like develop this philosophy in the first place i guess and and sort of why we see form and content at the center of all of these different fields of study and also i'm assuming you think the same way, but you could not. But I, I think form and content is at the center of, of sort of all, all of these like fields of study and, and sort of realms of philosophy that we're talking about, whether it's like ontology or aesthetics sort of thing. So yeah, I guess that's a question. <laughs> I knew that we were going to need to tackle this and I was also low key like terrified of having to try to describe this at this point. Well, I want to actually come back to something you said earlier that maybe was also a formative moment for me to think about form and content in the discussion about materialism versus idealism, about political organizing. Again, that's one of the ways that I relate myself to this kind of like philosophical exploration. So I actually heard Zizek speak at a, he gave a lecture a couple of years back in Houston that I went to with uh, some of the Red Library gang. And, you know, there was this moment there that was, I look back on it and I think this moment was, you know, in a very afterward retroactive way. I think it was more influential on me than I realized for, for some time. 
So basically, it's the question and answer period. You know, Zizek is just sitting on stage. It, it was a very, it was at a community college. It wasn't very big. There was like maybe 100, maybe 150 people there. And there was someone from, from what I gathered was from the Platypus Society. And I won't go into that, but for anyone that knows, you know, usually Platypus will show up at a lecture of different people, different other organizations, and we'll, you know, try to ask really tough critical questions based on their own interpretation of socialist history in the 19th and 20th century. Um, I have friends in Platypus, so I won't say too many things. I've been to Platypus events, but, you know, this is kind of a reputation that they have. And so basically, one of the questions they ask is kind of what you were saying, Sam, is like, sure, you're talking to me about Lacan and Hegel and all this other bullshit, but how does this help me understand, you know, what people need? Like, what do they need for food and housing and everything else? And Zizek just, it was really great because I think they tried to move on, but Zizek like literally stopped the next person asking a question. He said, hey, actually, hold on. I want to, I want to answer this question. I want to have a discussion about this. And I mean, it was actually incredibly endearing because it just, I think I was like a little like not as much of a Zizek stand as I used to be. But that moment to me was, it was a really endearing moment because I'm like, you know, I was like, he is still sitting in this fucking community college lecture hall with, you know, like he flew all the way over here to do this. And like he, he genuinely, you could tell he was passionate and genuine about wanting to engage in discussion with whoever wanted to talk about shit. So anyway, he, Zizek basically says, well, how do we define what bread and butter issues are? He's, and then he told a story about, you know, in Slovenia growing up, how what would be defined as bread and butter, like certain right-wing reactionary parties took power and they would define issues around identity and like, you know, sort of immigration and refugees, they would come to define those as being more important than like housing and food for people. And I think like what he was trying to get at is like, you know, a lot of people critique stuff like Zizek or like Lacanian analysis as being hyper abstract and not connected to day-to-day life. And I think the point was, listen, everything you think is like material, like the material concrete reality, this is always being defined and shaped by like the ideal and the abstract. And so it it would just like, it really hit me, especially at that moment in my organizing, because it was this feeling of like this dichotomy or this like seeming contradiction or opposition between ideal and material is like completely ridiculous. And yes, like we need to fucking just tear this down as fast as possible. And I think one of the things that we've hopefully done on Red Library, even though we haven't said it this way, as I think we are always trying to like engage with things like and explode that dichotomy. You know, this is one of the reasons mm-hmm. why whenever I've heard Todd McGowan say like, well, at the end of the day, I'm not a Marxist. I consider myself an idealist. And part of me is like, well, that whole distinction is bullshit in the first place. <laughs> like I thought you were a <laughs> yeah. Hegelian, you know? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, like the sort of like uh, common joke towards Hegel amongst Marxists is uh, that Marx uh, turned Hegel on his head, and then the 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 joke back to the Marxist is the Hegelian says, "Well, that's fine because Hegel can stand on his head just fine," uh, <laughs> and, uh, and that's sort of like uh, implying like he didn't actually do it, quote unquote. But then also, the, you know, like the dialectical like Hegel's whole thing is the dialectic. So like standing on your head is like that he has feet on like both sides of him, sort of thing. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, and I think yeah, I, I I was enamored by your story, and I, and I was I was moved by it. So. I didn't think of anything to say in response. That's but. okay. I mean, it, again, it was like, it was one of those moments that wasn't just like, to me, it signaled something much bigger than how I had typically engaged with politics. I mean, just to try to answer your question and not duck it with a, <laughs> a yeah, Zizek yeah. story. Okay, so I'll sort of respond to you with with uh, this this joke that I like. It's like a, an Iranian joke. <laughs> this is uh, real guess, theorizing right here. Which... <laughs> in the spirit of Zizek, uh, <laughs> I suppose he likes jokes a lot. So it's a, it's an old uh, Iranian joke. It's uh, for for anyone who's seen the Abbas Kiristami film, T- uh, Taste of Cherries. It's in that film. But uh, so a man goes to the uh, doctor and he says, "Doctor, uh, my entire body is in pain. Every inch of it. Like if I touch my." stomach it, it, i just get a searing pain in it if i touch my head my my head just like hurts immensely if i touch my legs my my feet my hands my arms everything hurts and i don't know what's wrong with me and the doctor says okay let's let's take a look and and the doctor gives him you know a once over a whole a whole exam and then at the end the doctor says uh, you're perfectly healthy but your finger is broken <laughs> and, and, beautiful uh, uh, and i think that's sort of like in sort of any any sort of politics has to realize that the pain felt throughout the entire body comes from like the broken finger which is sort of like you know it's like the creation of the pain being you know quote unquote content and then the form is the source of of that 
pain, which is the broken finger. And I think most people are like the guy in the joke where it's like they they touch their body, they assume it's their whole body that that there's something wrong with it and and you know it's like we need the doctor to tell us that our our finger is broken i think if that's like a good like summary of of that i that notion in the as it relates to politics and this idea of just like materialism and idealism and sort of like you know it's like uh, sort of a lot of discussions on the left is just like you know like how are we going to distribute electricity and like and like uh, these engineering problems and like these sort of like hard realities of you know like what this communist society is going to look like and this is something we've spoken about that's an important part of this is is that any communist politic that doesn't incorporate the sort of like incompleteness of being and these sort of abstract conceptual realities in it is is doomed to fail i think and that these these things we view as idealist and uh, abstract that we tend to avoid, I, th- I think, is sort of is is very like reductive and limiting, and that that sort of any communist politics that doesn't like take that into account is again like missing the the forest for the trees, and that those are as much you know bread and butter issues as like how clothes are going to get distributed <laughs> and stuff like that. Yeah, the traumatic cut in the real <laughs> is a bread and butter issue. <laughs> Yeah, You know, something that I think we discussed a little bit in the Conspiranoia episode we did on The Regrettable Century, how a lot of times we have this idea that there is ideology and then there's the material world and how ideology is this thing that's like layered over the top of it. But, you know, a thing that Zizek says, but I, and I think it's actually very much in, in alignment with kind of what we're talking about, is this idea that reality itself is ideological. And I think it's another way to like describe exactly what we're pushing for here is that, you know, Again, it's to just explode this distinction or the way that like, you know, Benjamin would say that the structures of the economy, like how capitalism structures the nature of the world is like reflected into these other types of like culture and media and like religion and whatever it is. But I think that's this idea that reality itself is ideological is like a a way that I've been very drawn to that idea. And I think the reason why is because of this exact kind of thing that we're talking about or what we're pushing for, because it's a different way to think about this way that form and content relate to each other and this sort of like vanishing point kind of idea. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's like, I mean, I assume a lot of people said this, but like the the greatest fiction of all is like the fiction that our, our, our social reality is like reality sort of thing. Like we need the illusion that our reality is quote unquote, you know, real. Yeah, and I think it's sort of, stuff like that is like for me it kind of goes all the way back to even just like plato and and stuff like that and and sort of the great epicurean misreading of him i find where um this idea of like plato's general sort of idea of there's like this representational world that we live in and then there's this ideal world of forms where like everything uh, sort of really is where it's like you know it's like here there's all these trees trees are always used as an example where there's like trees all over the world but then there's like the the word tree like the ideal tree that exists as like a form sort of thing that all these representations of trees sort of will always fail to represent but but the the key point in plato is that th- these forms don't exist like they're not there it's it's the idea of them and their absence that has material a material affect on sort of the way we live and sort of how how we treat everything from desire and being and politics and and everything. It's it's the absence of them that that sort of manifests itself within people and and, and that sort of like gets at, gets at what you were saying about ideology, where it's like there's there's ideology and there's reality, but it's like or the ideology is in the reality, and that's even something like Althusser and has has said before, where it's like it's like uh, what, what was his example? It's like it's not that the ideology is like you believe you should walk through a crosswalk it's like the ideology is the physical lines painted on the ground makes like is what makes you want to walk in uh, think you should be walking in them and stuff like that i sort of mentioned epicurus because you know he his whole notion was to try and like undo uh like plato's du- dualism by by saying his his whole thing was there you know he's sort of following a uh, democritus he sort of is like the an atomistic philosopher uh, like a materialist, an atomist materialist philosopher, where uh, there's, you know, his his distinction was that there's void and there's matter, and that the the void sort of is just the the space around the atoms as they shoot around and stuff like that. But then, you know, someone like Hegel would say, no, the vo- the void and the matter are just the same thing, are just the division of the same thing, and that the void is the matter 
and and is what sort of the matter erupts out of, I suppose. And and we talked about this, I think, when I sort of like was we were like talking back and forth, and I sort of told you like my maybe like theory or definition of the relation between form and content and how the two things are irreconcilable where like content and form are just these two opposing forces but form is the void in which content comes out of or like the basket in which like content sits it's like content can never be created without form and then form can never be seen on its own like you someone you can never like see cinematography or something like that like you have to film something that is viewed and then cinematography is revealed through that so it's like the two things sit opposed but then are reliant on each other and you know one creates the other and the other creates the one and and stuff like that and so this like paradox of form and content is something i'm like i hope we do going forward this idea of like void and matter form and content uh, the sort of like op- opposition of them and then sort of the the fact that they are like like one creates the other and, and that one exists in the other sort of thing. Yeah. So at the risk of complicating this even further, let's talk about Lacan. Um, so one of the things I've been very interested in lately, and this has kind of shown up most forcefully, I think, in the writing that I've been doing is the the way that for. I think a Lacanian psychoanalytic perspective, we talk about the realm of what we call the imaginary, like the image and yeah. its relation to, you know, typically we could talk about it in this relation to symbolic, the symbolic and language and everything else. But I think what's like been really interesting to me is the relationship between the imaginary and the real. So, you know, just to think about us as actually, again, like in conversation and dialogue with other like podcasts, other work that's being done on this. I was recently listening to the Why Theory episode on the imaginary and one of the things that really struck me about it was they, again, I think that not all, hashtag not all Lacanians, but, you know, for them, I think that they're very interested. And in, I've started to have this idea that I think like different Lacanians align themselves or emphasize different registers. And that ha- which register yeah. they emphasize, I think, is deeply, deeply grounded in their po- in their politics. They will oh, never yeah, talk about sure. it this way, but but I absolutely think it very much aligns with certain political and class and like, you know, gender and race characteristics as well. Like I yeah, think it's for sure, yeah. Yeah. I think it's like it's it's part of why you emphasize certain things the way that you do. Which again might be something we could talk about. Like how does your <laughs> class position, like where you're at in the structure, you know, how does that shape the way you like relate to content or something? And and then how like those who emphasize the Baromian not as as sort of the, the all three together. <laughs> where where that puts you because yeah i mean there is but yeah keep going keep i was going gonna away. say i want to just start running with that just uh at full speed but i'll i'll exercise some restraint for once in my life uh, i think yeah. the idea was that you know they talked about how for imaginary identifications they said like pa- like they paper over the cut of the real like the contradiction the void at the heart of us as like subjects the way we come into the world the way we're you know, experience um, situation and gender and like, you know, the the family and the father and the symbolic. And there was this way that I couldn't help but think that, let me put it this way, I'm, I'm trying to gather my thoughts about this. So there was a way that I think, I can't remember if it was McGowan or Angley that said this, but they basically said, if you think of it like a chain link fence, right? That for the realm of the imaginary, I think that for, again, hashtag not all Lacanians, but at least some, like look at the image as like, again, like quote unquote papering over the real. So the idea would be that in a chain link fence, the imaginary or the image is the actual metal of the fence itself. But mm. the real would be the, the spaces in the fence, you know, or the gaps. And they were basically kind of, from what I gathered, they were saying, well, it's what we're trying to get at is we're emphasizing the gaps and the absences. And for me, I'm like, okay, I love that idea, right? And especially in the context in which Lacan was writing and talking about ego psychology and like the dominance of that in the US, uh, you know, the way that imaginary identifications. And again, I don't think that Lacan is talking about this, but I do think this is something that is a deep, like visceral fear in a lot of politics today is... The idea of like a like an imaginary identification or an image that papers over all gaps, I think is something that was a horrible, catastrophic 
aspect of things that happened in the 20th century, Matt, like things about fascism and like maybe aspects of how Stalinism sort of played out and the brutality of that and like in, in, you know, like the purges and everything else. But I think like what, what I've like kind of wondered about too is like how often is this really a question of emphasis the way that people are talking about it? Like, so if you're a Lacanian and you're like, well, I don't like imaginary identifications. I really want to talk about the real or the symbolic. It's like, how much is this really just a question of like what particular element you wanting to emphasize again, which I think is probably based in your like your material conditions and politics in certain ways. But I do wonder if part of the reason to explode this dichotomy of form and content or like material and ideal isn't just to like get to the absence. It's also, I think, to reshape or to sort of reopen the possibility the way we relate to content. Because I think a lot of the time, like if we're not aware of like the inconsistency or the absence or the void and how that's like structuring the way that we interact with content, I think it also like collapses our ability to engage with it or the the sort of openness or radicality in which how we relate to content, how that could look. Yeah. What you said reminded me of going back to that, the Kuleshov effect in like film editing, where it's like sort of the act of affect of being affected by this edit this this cut from one image to another is um and that that affect the act of being af- affected is is almost like parallel for me i think to the idea of the master signifier as this pure form that exists without content and and then is sort of like replaced with different content depending on you know whether you're a nazi or a stalinist or a capitalist or or whatever uh is in the the point of the master signifier is that it's like if you take the content away then it's just like exists as a pure form which as we've established already can't happen like you can't like see cinematography you can't like see these things there has to be content in them for them to be there and in a way, it's like sort of getting beyond the content of the master signifier is then how you realize that like when the content goes away, the master signifier goes away sort of thing and sort of how like the revolutionary politics should seek to do that, should uh, seek to leave behind or transcend beyond the idea of like a, a master signifier or a sort of a, a main point of, I think, both of the theory we're working on move beyond the idea of like a narrative of, of having a narrative in society and and I think a narrative of society and that affect sort of coincides with that idea of the master signifier in that. So, so someone like two people, I suppose I can bring them up now that have like heavily influenced me in, in all facets of life is uh, Susan Sontag and Robert Brasson. Mm-hmm. Uh, Susan Sontag, the, the cultural critic and writer and, and Robert Brasson, the filmmaker, in that they're sort of, you know, Susan Sontag's essay against interpretation, like this idea of how we, we need to go beyond this this like hermeneutic approach to life, this idea of like meaning and having these symbols and, and narratives that, you know, quote unquote, like paper over these gaps and you know her her like nice phrase that she uses she's talking about art and an erotics of art but but i think we need like an erotic politics as well hell and, yeah uh, <laughs> horny gang rise up <laughs> and then robert Bersan, who sort of his his whole goal as a filmmaker was that he viewed cinema up until he came along as just like filming theater and he was like okay how can i use this medium because he started out as a painter and how how could he use things like editing and cinematography and um you know acting and like the formal elements of them to create like an affective experience that i think you know and sontag was a huge fan of Brisson, I think because he that was sort of his goal was to was to not have like you watch one of his films and sort of be like, okay, well, what does this mean? And what is this line telling me about the like, you know, what is this line expositing to me about the story? And it was purely you were watching for something else, you know, like the the famous uh, joke about him is like his film, A Man Escaped, gives away the ending in the title. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so it's yeah, like yeah. you're then watching for another re- you're you're not watching to follow a story you're watching for something else and and I think is, is sort of what Sontag was getting at and that sort of that idea can translate across all these different fields that we're talking about, I suppose. Yeah. Well, I want to let everyone know too, a book that you suggested to me that I've been working on over the last couple of days that's related to Bresson is called Neither God Nor Master, Robert Bresson and Radical Politics by Brian Price. So I have to tell you, this book, it was a perfect thing to recommend because this is right in the ballpark. And I think it does explicate a lot of what we're getting at in terms of 
you know, the interpretation of Bresson as being this like very transcendent, like religious filmmaker and, and uh, Price's sort of attempt from what I've read so far of trying to actually say that there's actually like someone can be a Christian filmmaker, like have a religious worldview, but that you can't collapse everything to that. And the sort of radical elements of crime and all of those ways mm-hmm. that he's trying to subvert like the material as well. It isn't just about the transcendent, it's the material. Yeah, definitely. And I think Brisson is like a, a nice sort of like Hegel said about Napoleon uh, that the clouds descended onto earth when Napoleon arrived in, in <laughs> Prussia. World world spirit has arrived. And and I, I would say the same thing about Brisson. Well. So, I, are put, you, I put him, he's up there, right, with Napoleon. With Napoleon. Are you telling me that for you, Brisson is like world spirit behind the camera? <laughs> Yeah, definitely. (laughs) For sure. Yeah. And I mean, I think sort of like a lot of things in film that we just like see as commonplace now were just like, these were like novel things he was doing at the time. And, and, and sort of this idea, you know, his, like his famous quote, I'd rather someone feel a film before they understood it. And, and how he, he sort of had ma- maintained the sort of because he he described himself as a Christian filmmaker. His film uh, Oh Hazar Balthazar is could be seen as a Christian allegory. He made a movie about Joan of Arc, but uh, yeah, he he described himself as a Christian filmmaker. But then there's this whole other component, you know, in, especially in films with like Lajean and and uh, the Devil probably and stuff like that. Like you know, in in that book, Brian Price talks about him as like the those films as a reaction to May '68. And and how those two things are are always like entwined in like a Mobius strip for Bursan and and sort of that as like an informer to someone's politics I think I think is it has always been sort of helpful for me I think one of the discussions we started to have is about Bresson's idea of like feeling a film before you understand it which to mm. me I guess the way that I've been coming at this is. I think it's related to like sort of like destructing narrative, but it's really about like for me, the role of image in politics. And maybe this is why I'm so drawn to the imaginary register in Lacan and sort of my own therapeutic work is sort of like, you know, it's kind of this idea. It's very similar to what we're talking about. It's this idea that, you know, whenever you engage in working with someone around like trauma and like experiencing you know, brutality and violence. I think there's this idea of like, well, you need to get to the way that like the unconscious is like structuring, like, you know, the conscious experience of that person, their day-to-day experience. You talk about the symbolic and the signifiers and blah, blah, blah. And like that, I do that stuff. You know, I do utilize those techniques and approaches in my therapeutic work. And yet I can't help but think that, you know, the thing that becomes really powerful is not so much like the narrative that someone has of their life, which is like this bullshit postmodern kind of emphasis and a lot of like modern like clinical practice and social work practices like, oh, we just need to like rewrite your narrative and everything else, which I think is just like, I mean, I've used some of that stuff with people I work with and I think it can be helpful every now and again. But actually what I find is most interesting is that underneath like a coherent narrative, if there even is one, which I think this is one of the things that if we have time to get to this or we can do this next time, I want to talk about Phantasmagoria and Benjamin and Fanon. Those three things together have literally become like the whole basis of like my way of understanding all of this stuff that we're talking about or the way that feels most Mm -hmm. applicable to like what I'm interested in. But, you know, working with someone who's a survivor of violence and trauma, one of the things that you find is like narrative by its very nature has been disrupted and destructed from the very beginning like the nature of those experiences is to destroy like the continuum of time in which narrative like has to play out in and so what you get instead is these sort of like i'll use a a benjamin like phrase these flashes of images that have this density and this content that in a way it's like if you want to work with that you have to go through the image and you can like reference the real and reference the symbolic but at the end of the day everything you're working with is the image and in the end you know whatever sense we make of the real and and the symbolic has to sort of reshape the image and how that image they have of themselves like functions in a different way and Mm -hmm. you know for me i think that's part of why i've been so drawn to this idea of like destructing narrative 
is because in a way, and I, this is really applicable in my own life. You know, most of the things that sort of locked in particular affect for me and like emotions and experiences of the world and myself was always through this like really weird, dense emotional imagery. To me, I think what I've been most interested in, like, you know, the capillaries blog pieces, like for anyone that's read those, like all intersperse images into the text, you know, and it isn't just to be like, this is a blog. And so this is shit that like blogs do, you know, but the idea mm-hmm. is like, like the image is designed to like sort of like flash up and like communicate a certain affective experience that is really kind of what's primary. It's like the text is sort of like trying to describe something, but ideally it's like the image flashing should be the thing that somehow like goes through the text into the affect itself, you know, or it's Mm -hmm. like, that's what I'm really trying to capture. It's like, that's me trying to work through content to sort of like try to reveal form of some kind. Give me one second to think about this uh, <laughs> and um, this is one of those things that is like a very active and ongoing sort of thing so you know if this is like <laughs> i think that's bullshit and does and is incoherent like i can take it so this is one of the things is like this is sort of where my own exploration of this like where it's like kind of brought me to is like wanting to look at this particular way of understanding it yeah i mean okay so i think about like what function like narrative serves in someone's life and it's always like it always comes back to like narrative is a way to like like to avoid castration yeah and uh, the sort of you know it's like in in hegel castration that he would refer to as the fall in in christianity and how the fall is in christianity it's like you know humans once lived in paradise and then they ate the forbidden fruit and fell from it but for hegel it's like we start off as fallen already it's like fallen is the beginning and then we retroactively have to create the narrative of the fall and paradise to like work the idea of our fallenness into you know a narrative of you know the world and our life and stuff like that and uh and sort of like a big like qualm i have with just like all overarching summing up of of like postmodernism is is this idea like there is no meta meta narrative so like you, your life can be like whatever narrative you want it to be sort of thing and it's like you don't get to have your cake and eat it too it's like if there's no narrative there's no narrative <laughs> there's no narrative sort of thing and uh, you don't just get to be like oh yeah there's no meta narrative so i can just like be whatever I want but uh, but yeah in that sense and I think something that that'll be like a big part of the the relation between like the imaginary register as like a register of narrative and the real as sort of like the point of liberation maybe from from it I suppose would you would you sort of agree with that yeah I guess I I think of it as like sort of like a process I guess is how I think of it now like because I think that you know in my experience like one of the reasons why there's such a critique or skepticism of the imaginary and a lot of like standard Lacanian perspectives is because the way that it operates in the very first stages of life. So, you know, if you take the mirror stage and like how that develops, you know, the ideas is like you experience the body. I mean, this is very, very early Lacan, but I still think, I think it tracks throughout his writing, even if he didn't like emphasize it like as as much as he did, you know, in earlier stages. But the idea is that, you know, you come into the world, you're experiencing the body, sensation, sound, you know, all this stuff. And it's like a bumbling chaotic mess and so part of how you you're able to gain some sense of mastery over that or just sort of like become functional is to again like see yourself reflected in a mirror and and instead of this like bumbling chaotic mess of sensation and and sort of perception you see yourself in the mirror and you say that's me Like, I'm Mm -hmm. that thing. I'm actually, it isn't all this chaos. There's like this entity that has solid boundaries. You know, the later Lacan like would also say that, but what makes that process sort of suture into place is the, the, the mother or the parent standing over you that then basically sort of like kind of you look back at them and then the parent would say, yes, that's you. You know, so there's this sort of role of like the symbolic coming in and like the big other. But I think that like I understand and I I think it is like it's important to understand like how in that moment there is a way that like an image of the self 
and the subject like does paper over like or it sort of makes coherent something that feels very chaotic and incoherent i think the thing mm-hmm. that like has been most concerning or i guess like what i'm most interested in let me put it this way is you know one of the things i say a lot in the last blog piece i just put out the other day that third part of the the dialectical pessimist subjectivity is kind of what bruce fink calls going from being a subject of desire to being a subject of drive and i think that there's something really important here and i actually think it is strongly aligned with affect theory and a lot of the stuff that i i've seen in therapy and and going through therapy myself and then also working with others is there's a way that going to the real as a place of emancipation or a sort of liberatory experience of how to like engage with the real as much as you can. I think that like what I'm most interested in, it's like, well, how does that then retroactively or open up a space for engaging with the imaginary in a different way? Because to me, I feel like we absolutely need those images just to like fucking exist in the world. And I guess I'm skeptical of them in certain ways. I just think that, I mean, if, if later Lacan is right and like the Borromean knot is really a really helpful way to understand the subject, you know, the real and the, and the symptom like circulates through all the registers. And I'm just sort mm-hmm. of interested of like what happens whenever the symptom like gets to the imaginary. Right. And I'm sure like there's all sorts of fucking yeah. Lacanians who have been writing about shit like that, you know, and I'm sure I'll read them at some point. But I guess like yeah. what I'm interested in is not so much like to emphasize one or the other or discard the imaginary, but mm. more to say whenever you, let's say hypothetically, you could become a subject of the drive, you know, to sort of encounter the real. And, and I think Zizek is still preeminent for me in this respect, like how engaging with the real is sort of the side of emancipatory politics, of revolutionary politics in a way. But then what happens whenever you do encounter that? Like what happens to the other registers, I guess? Yeah, and I think, I mean, this is a big part of like Zizek's politics and I would agree with it as well is that as that the idea of liberation is what Lacan uh, called a, a touche, like uh, the sort of like encounter uh, with the real that doesn't sort of traumatize yes. um, mm-hmm. a subject, but sort of pr- provides them with with a moment of insight that there is in fact no other, and that sort of like emancipation has to like be that has to be at like the center of it. I think that that sort of is is a much better way to put it than you know this sort of phrases like you know reconciling with like the the contradictions of you know the process of history and and stuff like that or like or you know like even just like transcending beyond like the alienation of capitalism and and, and things like that is I think that at the at the core there has to be like an almost like turning towards like a like an ironic like self awareness about itself where it's like if there was like a self aware this idea of like knowing that there there is no other and that and that sort of like that that moment of insight is sort of like i guess like the 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 core of emancipation and that the sort of key to that lies in like analyzing the the structure of affect and and how it sort of exists in in the real like bringing it back to the ideas of like the moment of cutting in in film is is like the void that then is like the affective sort of moment and like and sort of relating that back to absence and and the vanishing point and stuff like that how how like the the absence of the other and the realization of that is sort of the key for me to sort of any sort of like revolutionary politics and and sort of like like a radical ontology i think what what we're like getting at is like affect as like as like a source uh, as like an agent of that yes Uh, i think that's exactly right yeah Yeah, and i know we've talked about this too you know at the end of all of this that's why like affect theory to me is still a necessary and crucial component it's not sufficient I don't think because in my experience, a lot of like affect theory, like so easily collapses into just a very, I think, powerful, but yet still very trapped in sort of an individualistic kind of like experience of the world, even if it's experiences of like oppression and marginalization. You know, there's no like collective subject in affect theory, even though I think there could be in a lot of the readings I've done of it. But I think what it does get at, and I think this is what most people in left politics, I think they're striving for it. I think they're reaching for it. But I think it's very difficult to like know how to thread the needle on this is that, you know, a lot of people come to left politics because they feel alienated and depressed and deal with oppression and marginalization and exploitation and everything else. Right. There's a reason why you get drawn to these politics and, and, and it's a very personal one. I think what I like see most often 
is that like that experience of affect as like uh, again the way to sort of engage with the real or this sort of like sight of that experience of emancipation I think it's like it's very difficult to sort of encounter that and then again like kind of say okay well like what what after that right because I think more often than not it's kind of like what you're saying Sam is like most of the time our encounter with the real in that way does feel deeply traumatizing and destructive you know it feels like something you have no ability to respond to it effectively you know how do you encounter the real or like you know graze the real or even come close to being in its orbit and not have it destroy you but to actually like provide this sort of like affective generative like catalytic moment that you know for me i think what again what i'm interested in is like okay like could you then like reshape the way you encounter image or utilize image that doesn't have to be based in the big other, right? Because that's the whole mm-hmm. thing about image is like, and that's why Lacanians are so skeptical of it is like, because the nature of the image, it, it's a way that you get like botched or like you get kind of confined by the nature of the symbolic and the big other. And it's like, so my, my question is like, okay, well, like if I can, as weird as this is, like, you know, sort of like skirt past the real, but get close enough to, to like sort of experience it but not have it destroy me or like not sort of have it traumatize me that deeply does it help me then re-engage with the world in a new way i mean i think it does you know this is one of the things that like zizek has said about capital like one of the reasons why he'd always been so skeptical of certain types of revolutionary politics is because or let's say the structure of desire okay like the idea that like oh well we just need to like recognize that Uh, we desire in a certain way or that we're satisfied by our dissatisfaction as a secondary sub like a substitute gratification and so we just need to recognize that like that's the radical move and like you know Zizek's response to this that I've read and like sort of like read some some very interesting like works on this we're going to talk about these on the regrettable century pretty soon actually is essentially that listen like capital as a system is the most like destructive harnessing of death drive imaginable on a global scale. So how the fuck is like how I relate to my desire on an individual level, how is that ever going to be sufficient to challenge, you know, what capital is? And Zizek has said like what we need is a way to collectively organize death drive to like counteract it, you know, to actually serve as something that could challenge it on its own grounds. I'm very, very sympathetic to this idea. And I think that sort of thinking about affectivity and collectivity as a way to sort of like collectively organize around drive and around the death drive in a way that doesn't traumatize us, but actually serves as a sort of radical emancipatory starting point to me feels primary. Yeah. And I think I mentioned like cinema so much, obviously, because I it's a, a main interest of mine, but also because, you know, we keep talking about the imaginary and, and how sort of the the mirror stage is sort of such like the sort of you can't like say one m- mention one without the other in the same sentence and how in, in a lot of sort of film theory in, in like the in the uh, 70s and 80s and stuff like that sort of use that idea in like a lot of like critiques of cinema as like the the screen the cinema screen as uh, the mirror and the mirror stage. But then Joan Kopchik, uh, it wasn't until she said, no, it's not that the screen is a mirror. It's that the mirror in the mirror stage is a screen sort of thing. And and so um, and that's like what makes it an image. It's not it's not that um, you see yourself reflected in a mirror. It's that you see an image of an entirely like other thing. And yeah. that and that sort of that that idea of like then going back to Brisson of the idea of like Im- images being and Brisson was someone who said you know he has he has a quote that says like like it doesn't matter what is your image all that is it, what matters is the space in between them is like the time and the and the space in between them and like he he basically like treated filmmaking like it was uh, like he was like making a painting he he famously said uh, I want my films to feel like one moment when you watch them sort of thing which I think is like a a nice a nice beautiful phrase but i think what you're getting at is the idea of like and and maybe sort of we can we'll like explore this as we go on but the idea of just like it's not maybe that we're like i i do like hate narrative and want to like move beyond it sort of thing but it's not like it's like the goal is to like erase the imaginary it's to sort of like live in like maybe in like the burmian uh not like sense where it's like the three are just like always sort of together where it's it's not like imaginary real symbolic it's like it's one unit where a sort of thing i guess yeah where it's like it's like the the sort of affect of the real 
exists in the image sort of thing. I'm almost falling out of my chair. I'm like just nodding in enthusiastic <laughs> agreement because I think this is exactly like what the second piece in that dialectical pessimist subjectivity is like really trying to get at, which is like, okay, so take the whole idea of the symptom seriously, right? You know, it's kind of like explain the symptom to me or I'll fucking kill you. It's like, don't <laughs> yeah. collapse this into like weird ass, like mystery school teachings of like Jacqueline Miller. It's like, give me something to really grab onto with this. And what does it mean? that makes sense and and is relevant because i do think it's incredibly relevant without necessarily again having to like guard it as like secret knowledge like like help me understand how this makes sense of the world to me i think it does i mean my and my reading of like lacan himself and like secondary sources and everything else that's what it's it seems to be you know this is one of the reasons why i'm such again i'm so influenced by mari rudy is the idea of like the symptom that experience of all of them happening together this is a little off the cuff but this is why I'm so interested in like Benjamin and like divine violence and messianic time because I think yeah. in a certain way, like what we're saying is like all three of them t- to exist together is also like I think the experience of messianic time in a way. And I think that there's a reason why like the symptom as like sort of circulating or like this affective kind of experience circulating through all of them at once is what Mari Rudy calls the singularity. Like it's there it's yeah, like yeah, the idea sure, that you're yeah. a singular like it is a singularity type of like ontological like phenomena or like whatever the fuck it is. Yeah. I guess in, in a more poetic way of what I mean, it's like I, I sort of use the example of, of like in Christianity of the paradise and, and the fall sort of thing. It's like what we do now is like construct the image or the narrative of paradise to like deal with the fact that we're fallen and like what i would want for the world is is to have an image of the fall to be in like the image of the to have the fall be the image and not like this this supposing thing is the image and then the fall is the real but to live in the image of the fall and i think the the funny thing is, is like i i sort of i firmly believe this is why people enjoy paintings of landscapes because in paintings of landscapes you have the vanishing point which is the real, you have the sort of like lines of depth, which is the symbolic order. And then you have like, let's say it's like a a cityscape or something like that. Then you have the images of the buildings following the symbolic order, which is the imaginary. So it's like all three are happening once in a paint, in like a painting. And, and I think that's why people like them. Uh, That's just like a side thought that I just (laughs) thought of from what you're saying about like the idea of the singularity, but like, I mean, it it does, it does connect to it because it's, it is all, all three occurring at once and, and all, three sort of determining each other because like the it's not that the lines you know the let's say the lines are the symbolic order like you, you know what i mean like the the depth of field lines that like when you draw buildings in a painting it's like the the roofs are always like curved based on a line of like depth do you know what i'm talking about yeah uh-huh, yeah yeah okay okay, okay. I, i've studied <laughs> art a little bit you know <laughs> okay, okay okay yeah i mean this is like stuff you uh, i'm like i'm like oh yeah i'm an artist but like this is like stuff they teach you in like your sophomore year of high school about like drawing but, uh, that's right you uh, should just own it still still talk like it makes you some like hyper elitist <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm gonna like make rudimentary knowledge great again or something like that. But, uh, <laughs> what, would that uh, what would that be? A V M R K G A? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, give me, give, like, I'm gonna get that printed on some red hat. <laughs> I was gonna say we're gonna, we're gonna have that in our our Lost Horizons Etsy store. <laughs> make rudimentary <laughs> knowledge great again hats. <laughs> yeah, and so it's like it's it's this idea of like it's not that pe- people always like you know it's like when they think of a drawing or a painting it's like it's the it's the the actual like the content of the drawing that I'm seeing sort of thing. But it's like those parallels, those lines. Uh, that determine the sort of like depth of field in the painting aren't like on their own. They're de- the trajectory of them is determined by the vanishing point, which is like usually seen as the end of the lines. Yeah. But it's like, it's almost like it happens in reverse. Like the lines come out. Right. The vanishing instead of like moving in. And then those lines determine wh- how the images live within like the frame of the painting and so it's like all these things exist in a, in a singular moment in a drawing or a painting or something like that yeah i think that sort of like is maybe like an example of what mari rudy is getting at with her like idea of that i, I feel like this might be something to talk about in a future part of the red desert but you know there was a quote that i just found reading someone that i think i mentioned to you that um fingers crossed we might have him join us for an episode sometime. He's a professor actually in aesthetics 
and uh, our theory named uh, Sami Khatib. And he wrote a paper a few years ago called Barbaric Salvage, uh, Benjamin and the Dialectics of Destruction. Um, I actually just found another paper of his that's on um, Messianic Time and Benjamin and Marx that I'm going to read uh, tonight. And mm. one of the things that I, I think, for me, it was sort of like the paper I was hoping to find that would sort of touch on some of the things that we're describing. But in this paper, you know, again, this is kind of, I think, where I'd like to, you know, sort of explore this at some point. I feel like we're touching on it now, but it's actually a quote from um, Giorgio Agamben. And this quote, this is Agamben, he says, the original task of a genuine revolution is never merely to, quote, change the world, unquote, but also, and above all, to, quote, change time. And so I think that what I love about that is that, you know, whenever I think about narrative and I think about, like, let's say desire, and like the way that desire is experienced it always is like in i think what benjamin would call empty homogenous time it's a certain way that capital as like a set of structures or like a set of forms or like one big form i think isn't just about the commodity form which i think is part of it or like surplus value you know one of the things i'm really kind of interested in and this is me stumbling around in the desert, maybe being losing my mind. I don't know. But I think that like, I want to explore the way that the commodity form like reshapes our experience of time itself. And I think that one of the ways that we talk about desire it, that we talked about on like the capitalism and desire reading series is that I think the desire at the end of the day is still trapped in this kind of empty homogenous time that has to be structured like a narrative. And I think it reinforces this like image of the self of this like tragic suffering figure. This is what uh, Ben Ware talks about in his original conception of dialectical pessimism is that in contrast to that, he talks about the neurotic hedonist as sort of like the primary structure of subjectivity under capital. And, w- and one of the like necessary fictions, which again, the fact that he uses the phrase fiction and narrative to me is like, it's not a coincidence. One of the necessary fictions of being a neurotic hedonist is that there's this idea that there's something that if I just had this thing, it would satisfy my desire. The other has that object. They are fulfilled. They are Their desire has been achieved. I don't have that. And so the third necessary fiction is that I'm this tragic suffering figure because of it. And then you mm-hmm. sort of like get this secondary gratification of being a tragic suffering figure. That hits home to me because like I know what that feels like and it's very yeah. deeply alluring and enticing to get stuck in that form. But I think like what I'm most interested in is how that experience of the world and desire like in itself shapes time in a particular way. And so I think Mm. if you want to counteract that at the level of form and not just the content, i.e. you switch out different things that you desire. If you just found the right object to desire or even if you just were aware of the process, it would like stop it. I don't think that's the case. I think you you have to radically destruct the form and part of that would be to experience time in a different way. And so, yeah. and maybe that's like part of why I think the idea of the singularity is so um, so important to me because it's a different, like it would reshape how you experience time itself. I think. Yeah, definitely. I think I I I've I've I've, I've used this as an example before to describe something else in our talking in stuff we were talking about. I think it like applies now. Is I remember when the new. Uh, Terrence Malick film came out, A Hidden Life, and I remember like seeing it. And the whole the whole point of the story, or, or the whole point of the movie, is this this farmer in Austria like refuses to to sign the oath to Hitler and like fight uh, for the Nazis in World War Two. You know, it's like the whole premise of the film is like he's like I will not do this, and then and sort of like he gets arrested and and is executed and stuff like that. And the whole time, it's sort of like the side plot is like he's dealing with like his. Uh, his family and like the relation to like his decision and like how much weight it has and he's a, a Christian and sort of that is like the impetus for his decision is he doesn't want to kill and so there's a scene where he's like talking to uh, his priest when he's in prison and the priest says like look if you you just sign the oath he says like you can be a medic in the army and you won't have to kill anyone there you can get what you want and then and then the farmer says will I still have to sign the oath and the priest says, yeah. And he says, then I won't do it. And the, in, the interesting thing, when I walked out of the theater, I was just like, it's funny that in rejecting the oath, in sort of ref- refusing it, he still acknowledges that he believes in the fiction of it. Like he he believes that it's a real thing, but he's just rejecting it. And I feel like that's like a lot of people's 
politics now is this is like a even though we're hating this system and refusing the system and and sort of like trying to rebel against the system we still like believe in it wholly as a real as, as like not just a fiction and sort of i think that leads us to like you know especially now we sort of talk about you know especially since like politics has sort of become like sort of a morality play uh, at this point in in like a weird way where it's like we we talk about these notions of like justice and freedom as if they're like these sort of holy things that exist as, as, that have always existed throughout time and like are these sort of like immovable sort of ideas rather than just like you know part parts of of just like this those ideas are relative and sort of they're sort of divi- defined based on like historical context and and sort of depending on who's doing the defining de- determines like who is free and what does freedom mean and then the whole idea of like the fa- you know it's like Foucault it's like the only reason we be- like we have the idea of freedom is because there's a prison so like sort of achieving freedom should be moving beyond that idea in the first place anyways I'm going like off off topic but yeah it's like the whole idea of <laughs> in refusing it's like you're not then rejecting the narrative. You're believing the narrative. You're just occupying one side of it versus the person who just like wholly believes in the oath and like and stuff like that. It's like the narrative needs both people, the antagonism between both of those people to exist. And and rather than sort of the, the true revolutionary thing, which would be to, you know, acknowledge the, the master signifier that the oath is like part of the narrative of that the oath is content of uh, uh, two and uh, and like realize it's a fiction as such. So we would be in this perspective, as Zizek would say, against the double blackmail, because yeah. <laughs> I, I think that maybe, I mean, maybe this might be a good stopping point, but I think that this yeah, is exactly what we're yeah. getting at is that this whole exploding of form and content in this example, I think is beautiful. And it is perhaps the most pervasive one I've seen in like politics today is the idea that whatever is like the hegemonic order, the way to re- like respond to that or the true radical revolutionary move is to just, again, like occupy the other side of it, but yet it still believes in the narrative. It believes in the, f- in the, in the form, even though it's trying to exchange out the content for its opposite. And so I think that no one said this would be easy, but I think the true revolutionary move to me and kind of in line with Zizek, and I'm very much with him on this is always like, what is the third choice that no one is giving you? What is the yeah, third yeah, option exactly, that like yeah. no one is talking about? And like, that is the revolutionary move because that would explode the form itself. And that's what we have to look for. Yeah, definitely. And there's like, you know, and it, and it gets back to that, that idea of like in the seeing beyond the fiction and seeing the fiction as such is is sort of the moment, uh, the sort of event of realizing there is no other and sort of uh, or, or you know, as Hegel put it, so, like self othering, like becoming the other and, right. and sort of in that realizing there is no other and in sort of like that, like a contradictory way. I think sort of like I... I think I mentioned to you before is like we've sort of been seeing these uh, things like form and content as like these opposing forces and how one, you know, but sort of rely on each other and various uh, theorists we all like, like, you know, everyone from like Zizek and Zipancic and Badu and like all these people sort of see sexuality as the as like the core of being and the core of like a radical ontology and like a radical politics and i think sort of like something like sex is i don't know if like the example but like like we have to think about form and content the same way we think about sex where it's like sex is like the act itself the act of intercourse is sort of the reconciliation of those two things because like as we were talking about before if i'm like with my partner or something and like you know like fingering them or they're like giving me a blowjob that's not sort of seen as intercourse it's only it's when like the uh, you know when the 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 penetrating genital and the penetrated genital uh occur that we we define it as intercourse and and you know culturally speaking and i and you know i know there's like all the like new agey bullshit of of just like oh you know we we look deep into each other's eyes and and rub each other and make love and we're not having sex we're making love and whatever but like when we're teenagers there's sort of the the common thing is is like the bases is like the first base is making out second base is you know over the shirt touching of boobs third base is you know f- uh, hand jobs and stuff like that and, but it isn't until the the home run is intercourse like the completion 
is intercourse. The form of penetration and the content of what is being penetrated and penetrating always that's like when the two when form and content come together because like penetration but not by you know genitals is not intercourse and then like it's it's only when like the content of what is penetrating and what is being penetrated and then the form of penetration itself coincide that there's like a a reconciliation of form and content so like sex is the the idea of the sexual act is sort of the event is sort of that like radical event of like form and content coinciding so would you say that our project here to explode the dichotomy is equivalent to engaging in theoretical intercourse (laughs) or that's kind of like a way to think about it is like it is a way to think about how do you like collapse these two things down and and yeah and not not like and not like a postmodern way of just like rejecting like dichot like the dichotomy of them and so we should like sort of like like derrida's whole thing of just like there there's no dichotomy between like form and appearance so let's just like everything is appearance so let's just like be whoever you want sort of thing but he kind of but to sort of like realize as like sort of going back to like that epicurious is it epicure i always forget his name is it epicurious i thought it was epicurus epicurus or yeah all right epicurus who cares he's fucking dead i've been pronouncing it wrong the whole time now i look like an idiot but uh don't uh, worry i'll 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 paste in like an ai voice saying epicurus every time you say it (laughs) yeah and uh but his whole thing of like void and matter and then hegel being like no it's like these it's it's one thing divided it's like it's division itself And sort of thing where it's like so it's like form and content we we have to like reach the like sexual act of that of that thing not just sort of like smash the dichotomy just all together but sort of like reach the set reach the intercourse of the dichotomy i guess yeah i actually think i think that's a really interesting and like sort of definitely you know language is important right especially whenever you're trying to like slice these fine distinctions like i think what we're getting at is not like exploding the dichotomy but it is it's like sort of putting them in this particular relation yeah 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 yeah, 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 i think that's that's definitely much more kind of what we're getting at for sure yeah